Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Conversations with the Dean. I'm delighted today to welcome Professor Stephen Grazer from Harvard Business School. Welcome to the campus, Stephen. Thank you very much. It's terrific to be at Lipscomb. Well, we're delighted to have you, and I must say that we quite often have outstanding guests on this program who have long resumes, but I believe yours is the longest of them all. <laughs> and I'm not sure exactly how to condense this into 30 seconds, so what I'm going to do is just read a couple of sentences here. If the audience will forgive me for reading, I think this is worth the effort. You're the Richard P. Chapman Professor Emeritus at the Harvard Business School. You specialize in brand marketing, advertising, corporate communications, the business of sports, and nonprofit management. You're a graduate of Harvard College and the Harvard Business School. You've been active in research and teaching at uh, Harvard since 1958. That's more than 40 years by my calculation. More than uh, 50 years. You're a former editor of the Harvard Business Review and later its editorial board. You've written 16 books. You've published 300 Harvard Business School case studies. You've co-authored books such as The Business of Sports and Revealing the Corporation. You've uh, become a member of the co selection committee for the Boston Red Sox Hall of Fame. We're not in the limelight this week. <laughs> <laughs> and who knows how many other things you've done. So let me begin with this question. Your, your name may not be a household name, but you may be the world's leading expert on household names, since you're a branding expert. Tell me the secret of successful branding. Well, brand, every company is a brand at the corporate level. So many organizations, even nonprofits, like to think, well, we're kind of above having to worry about branding. The truth is, Others among one's stakeholders are thinking about you uh, as a brand and using brand-like terminology, at least the public's version. So why do I say that? I say that because brands tend to be defined by their track record, what it is that they actually perform. In the case of products and services, how good, how reliable are those products. You know, reliability was the hallmark of Toyota until Toyota 2010, as we conveniently call it, mm -hmm. caused a lot of people, including owners of Toyotas, to question that. Now, they since have done a lot of things to help repair that, but the underlying premise is what makes successful brands is consistent, effective, product performance, or in the case of service companies, service performance. When you go to the hotel to check in, are you receiving consistency with regard to the quality of the hotel room or the total experience that you're having there, whether it's the dining facilities, the conference facilities, um, whatever the case may be. Uh, for some people that mean may mean is are the towels fluffy, but I'm really talking about the way in which the hotel company delivers service even at the level of people that work in the trenches. The same for airlines. Service industries are much tougher to have consistency of performance in because a lot of it is in the mind sure. of the consumer. In the case of the business to business realm, the customer, it's somewhat easier because most of them are buying products that come with service where the product part at least has been calibrated to the specifications and needs or they, there has been an agreement that the buying company knows what the selling company is in fact providing. So it all comes down to me, my view, it all comes down to the product performance, the service performance, the reliability, the consistency of those things. Well, let me put you on the spot. Mm -hmm. Tell me a company that does branding right, and tell me a company that, in your opinion, does branding, branding very poorly. Well, most of the companies that do branding poorly don't exist anymore <laughs> um, for various reasons. And, and uh, you know, a company um, that fails to position itself clearly 
uh, and to follow through and perform to its own promised specifications. It's kind of like what happened to Polaroid near the end, mm -hmm. because even though the brand name may still exist, it, it doesn't exist as a business. And a lot of that had to do with failing to stay au courant with technology, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, if you're promising to provide the latest and best in photography, you need to be where photography is. Um, that was a seismic change of technology. Mm -hmm. On the good side, I would say the answers are mostly around companies that have two characteristics, like Procter & Gamble, um, where the CEO is a distinguished alumnus of the Harvard Business School, Bob McDonald. Uh, at Procter & Gamble, they have many, many different brands, um, almost all of which are successful and are kept successful. And some of that is the degree of, it, of attention that is paid to the, those brands, but some of it is they're always working at product improvement based on research with actual consumers. Well, let's play a word association game. Let yes, me throw sir. some names out, and you tell me what comes to your mind from a branding perspective mm -hmm. with these names. So let's start with this one, BP. BP is a terrific illustration of reputational travails of 2010. That's one of a number of chapters in 2010 of which Toyota, Tylenol, Redux, re return to Tylenol, uh, and Tiger Woods the brand are all, those are the three T's of reputational travail for 2010, but BP is the grand prize winner in the category <laughs> because BP performed grotesquely under pressure in an area that almost any energy company should have been totally prepared for. Now, I'm not suggesting that every company has an accident like the underwater explosion in the well. I am suggesting that in the same way that airlines have master plans for a crash, and particularly if a crash kills people, that energy companies that do oil exploration, or exploration especially under the sea, have to have plans. And BP was caught in a very egregiously exposed condition, especially when cameras were showing that the well was gushing on an international, a global audience watching on TV day after day after day after day for months. So BP's credibility, BP's reputation was swooning faster than the Red Sox in September of 2011. <laughs> and I think that we all like to talk about companies that develop a reputational reservoir, which is a phrase of my own. Uh, and sometimes that reservoir can help buffer uh, short-term winds of trouble and turbulence, but in the case of BP, whatever reputation they had quickly deteriorated because in at least five different dimensions, which I'm not going to bore your audience by going through, ranging from capability, demonstrated capability to deal with the issue, to communicating transparently about the troubles when everybody is watching, um, that BP dropped the ball. So when you mention BP, I have two major things in mind. One is what I just described, which is the 2010 failure. The other is something more subtle, but very meaningful, which is the promise performance gap, to use another phrase of mine, the promise performance gap of BP's efforts to position itself as an environmentally friendly energy company. And to me and my longtime research colleague, John Balmer of Brunel University in England, and we wrote about this and published about it as far back as 2002, so we're not after the fact commentators, that for an energy company to try to position itself as, energy, as environmentally friendly is potentially a very long commute because of 
the inevitability of environmentally oriented troubles that happen in something like the Deepwater Horizon, the Gulf of Mexico explosion. Sure. So I mean, it could go through that in a lot of detail, but their premise, which is that they could promise environmentally friendliness, they changed the brand name, they used the slogan beyond petroleum, they embraced that green and yellow petaled logo. Everything was signaling environment. And in reality, they came up very, very short. All right, let's try another one. What would Tiger Woods do, in your opinion, to repair his brand image today? Okay. Tiger Woods is at the intersection of two of my favorite areas of study and publishing, namely the business of sports and corporate communication, meaning communicating at this juncture on behalf of the gestalt of the brand. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Tiger Woods, if we ask ourselves, what's the essence that underlies his success as a brand? The answer is outstanding performance on the golf course. Not just very good golfer, but outstanding performance on the links. When Tiger Woods, if we go back to Thanksgiving of 2009, right, yep. Tiger got himself into a very, very uh, bad personal situation. He earned it. He did it on his own. Nobody else is to blame. But he made it worse because, as is the typical custom, including the Archdiocese of Boston in the first U.S priest sex abuse scandal, um, you start stonewalling, you start denying, you start hiding from the media, and it takes a long period of time before on February 19th, Tiger had his famous press conference where he wouldn't let any questions be asked, basically. Um, but something more had happened to Tiger besides the injury that he had had, which was this had a big effect on his psyche, on his head. So I laid it out as a three-stage process. First, Tiger had to get on top of himself, so to speak, figuratively. He had to get his psyche in order. It, that would allow him, enable him potentially to come back on the links. Number two, he had to demonstrate that he was again an excellent golfer, one of the world's best a guy that was in top five finishes, a guy that could win tournaments. Now, the truth is, has that even happened as we speak in October of 2011? And oh, not yet. Tiger's even dropped out of the top 50 money winners, and blah, blah, blah. Three is Tiger Woods the brand. The ticket of admission, my view, to Tiger Woods the brand being able to come back is for Tiger Woods, the golfer, again to be excellent, not just very good, to be excellent. And in order for that to happen, Tiger has to get on top of himself psychologically as well as physically. So I'm thinking that it'll be quite a while before companies are going to be willing to take a flyer on Tiger Woods and help rebuild his brand visibility in terms of having him be a favored endorser. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, Nike, of course, has stayed with him. That's a longer story because it's part of the philosophy of Nike that it stays with its um, endorsers unless they are grievously illegal in what they do. All right, a third one and a last one, Barack Obama. Barack Obama. Um, I will tell you and your audience and fan club that I'm not um, a student, an observer, or an analyst of the political environment um, from a reputation branding point of view. I do observe some elements. And um, I would say that in the case of Barack Obama, looking ahead to the imminent 2012 campaign, which is probably actually underway, that I would analogize to 2008. 
in 2008 what I said to those people privately with whom I spoke, not publicly, was in the 2008 election, whoever has D after his or her name is got a very, very, very high chance of being elected over anybody that has an R after his or her name, and the public is ready for a change, a meaningful change. And some of that is because of President Bush, and some of it is it's time for a change, some of it is because there wasn't anything really important that was being accomplished in Washington. Barack Obama was the beneficiary of that. Now, for 2012, a lot more people know a lot more about Barack Obama and his track record. Same kind of thing as a corporate brand. Is What is the track record? Well, the track record is mixed at best, even by a favorable observer, who might say, well, he's been interfered with by Republicans, and there's validity to that, but the other guys aren't supposed to be helping you. So one has to ask the question, and this is a question, not an answer to yours, which is anybody with an R after his or her name in 2012 is going to have an advantage, absent some major scandal that breaks within a short period of time of the election. And anybody with a D after his name, which is only one person in this particular election, is going to be disadvantaged unless something absolutely amazingly positive happens that lifts the economy in such an amazing way that people say, well, let's give him another chance. Like they did for George Bush, George W. Bush in 2004. Mm -hmm. Let me change gears. Change gears. You, uh, you corrected my math a minute ago, and you were exactly right. You've taught at Harvard more than 50 years, not more than 40. So if my math is right, I think you have maybe about 600 students at Harvard Business School in any given class. Is that, is that right? Well, now it's more like 900. Okay. <coughs> so but you, you, that's what it was when I was there. So you've seen several hundred thousand students well, come through Harvard Business School in, in your career. I've seen a lot. Tell me the student that surprised you the most with his later success or her later mm -hmm. success. I think it's less the surprise than, frankly, the discovery of people who weren't necessarily, you know, familiar names. They certainly weren't familiar names when they got there. Mm -hmm. Nobody is. It's one of the great things. I'm sure it happens here at Lipscomb um, where you're celebrating your 120th anniversary. Right. As, a, as, a, as a school, that there are people from earlier times who knew each other back when they were students, quote, before anybody was renowned, unquote, or had achieved very much. And that's what makes coming back to reunions and feeling part of a larger community, it's one of the things that's really terrific for any institution like yours and like the Harvard Business School or all of Harvard University, where we're about to celebrate our 375th um, anniversary as a university across the river. Um, I should mention, founded one year after the Boston Latin School, where I was fortunate enough to go to school, a six-year high school, and we always like to say that Harvard had to be invented as a place for Boston Latin School people to go <laughs> after they graduated. And first classes weren't at Harvard until 1638. And the first commencement graduation was in 1642. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I know, you're not really interested in too much more of that. So who are students that maybe are particularly memorable? I think that they are people who, and it's not so much that I want to go through names, it's that there are people, in one instance, somebody who, um, whose father was the founder of a particularly well-known firm in an industry that I work in, and this person has been so successful in his own right, albeit in the firm, where we know that there was no real election for who was going to be the next CEO, that I actually said at the 
um, at a, a gathering of that firm at the time that he was um, made CEO by his father, I said, the amazing thing about Blank, who's a student of mine, and I was invited to be there, the amazing thing is that if you all had an independent vote about who the next CEO should be without his father standing in the wings, he would still be mm -hmm. almost unanimously, if not unanimously elected. Well, that's a very, very rewarding phenomenon to see a young person who actually earned it when in fact one might say he was on a glide. Um, and that's the kind of thing you know, it's terrific, but there are also people who started out as generic people, just as many of your students have been, where you kind of say to yourself, it's not like I'm surprised. It's like I'm so pleased that this person has kept his nose to whatever the relevant grindstone was mm -hmm. that he or she became particularly successful. And a lot of them, as is true for anybody who's been around for a long time, I suspect the same is true for you, you love staying in touch with them. In the academic world, we don't have stock options. Um, <laughs> or if we do, they aren't worth anything and, and in terms of dollars. But the version that we do have, which is the relationships with people whom one stayed in touch with over careers, that is the kind of reward which is why we went into the business. Well, let me try one other name and then we'll yes, move sir. on to another area of questioning. So did you teach George W. Bush when he was a student at Harvard Business School? I never even knew that George W. Bush had <laughs> entered the Harvard Business School area and I didn't know he had left. The first time that I even knew that George W. Bush had been a student and a graduate of the Harvard Business School and this goes to my field of the business of sports, is when George W. Bush became the managing general partner of the Texas Rangers and the bio from Major League Baseball said, an alumnus of Yale and the Harvard Business School. Well, the Yale part didn't surprise me because the Bush family was big on Yale. Mm -hmm. But the Harvard Business School, I said, really? How did he get in and leave and elude me totally? <laughs> he must have majored in finance uh, because my courses are more. Strategery. Based. I think he majored in strategery. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it led to one of the very funny experiences in that a, a woman who'd been a research assistant of mine, she was uh, one of the very first female research assistants at Harvard Business School um, way back um, <clears throat> in the 70s. And her husband, who um, became a young faculty member at our place and became a major professor at the University of Michigan, there was a trivia question. Who was the only person, in, this was in the 2000 election, who was the only person ever to have been, been a teacher of both George W. Bush and Al Gore? And the answer is the husband of the person that worked with me closely, whom I know, James Reese, who had taught at the private school in Washington, D.C. when Al Gore had been a student there. And after he came to the Harvard Business School, Jim Reese, graduated and became a young professor, George W. Bush was one of his students. And that was a terrific trivia question. It's a great question. Great, great story. Thanks for telling that story. So a lot of people think that Harvard Business School is the best business school in America, perhaps in the world. Well, naturally, I would agree with that, especially checking my sweatshirt. <laughs> but I would say the most important thing to understand is there are a number of really excellent business schools. And whenever I advise people who are looking to make decisions about business schools, there are a couple of important things that I say. One is, of course, you probably want to have Harvard Business School on your list. Um, but there are other good schools depending on your orientation. If you're looking for entrepreneurship, uh, there's schools X and Y. If you're looking for 
a school that does what we do at HBS, but does it in a smaller environment where you can feel that you get a little bit more personal attention. Um, there are places A and B, et cetera. The other thing I'd say is, you know, most people say, and I do, that when you're applying to colleges, you always have a safety school, which is a good school that you'd be willing to go to, but it's not among your top choices. When you're applying to business schools, you should never have a safety school. If you can't get real, especially if you've taken several years of work after college before you apply, mm -hmm. which is what is generally advised, and 99.5% of entering HBS people have done that, that you want to be excited about the place that you go. And it could be because of the name of the school. I hope that's not the main reason. I hope it's because of content, because of the kind of work that they do there, et cetera, et cetera. But my advice is don't think about a safety school when you're investing two years after you've worked for maybe three or four years trying to earn money and now you're going to be spending money again. Uh, it, it's been just a couple of years ago, maybe three or four, since uh, a professor or two at Harvard wrote a book called The MBA Oath. And that came out at a point in time, uh, Professor Greiser, uh, Greiser, where there was a lot of concern about ethics in this country, mm -hmm. particularly in the business world. Uh, do you think that book is still important and relevant? Do we need a uh, version two of that book? Okay. I'm not sure that the book is um, ultra significant, but the idea is what's relevant. Mm -hmm. I don't know that one has to have read the book to understand the core idea. The question is, can the core idea actually influence behavior beyond the first gush of when a person graduates? From any place. Um, I think that the biggest success that the Harvard Business School has had institutionally in the area of ethics, and we've always had a course, a long, long time we've had a course, but I think our biggest success more recently has been a course that isn't called ethics, but it's about the behaviors that executives should have, notice the plural, in situations where responsibility and leadership are called for. And it's the, it's the only course in the required curriculum where every professor, or maybe all except one in a given year and out of six or seven, are full professors, tenured faculty, people who've been around, people who have a lot of experience. And the content is really around what is it like in the highest levels of management and in the boardroom when issues come up where companies have to decide what is it we really stand for and what is it we should really do. Um, and uh, among those faculty members are longtime professors and among them are people who've come from the business world to become professors of practice at our place, such as the distinguished Bill George, who had been a student of mine many years ago, mm -hmm. the um, former president of Medtronics, um, and a really insightful guy who really understands. It's sort of like what I call the opposite to Donald Trump. He is a person who understands what authentic leadership is really all about. There was an article in the New York Times earlier this week. It was an op-ed piece written by Bill Keller uh, entitled The University of Wherever. I don't know whether you saw this particular I piece I saw the or headline. Not. It's waiting for me to read when I get back Well, home. it's a fascinating piece, and it talks about the future of higher education and how rapidly it's changing. And one of the paragraphs particularly impressed me, and I'll just read you a couple of sentences sure. here. It says, uh, meanwhile, one of Stanford's most inventive professors Sebastian Thrun is making an alternative claim 
on the future. Thrun, a German-born and largely self-taught expert in robotics, is famous for leading the team that built Google's self-driving car. He is offering his course, Introduction to Artificial Intelligence, online and free of charge. The article goes on to say mm -hmm. that the same students who pay $50,000 a year for an MBA education can take this course free of charge. I think he has 130,000 students mm -hmm. signed up for this course. So my question to you, Professor, mm -hmm. is <laughs> if you had another 10 years or 20 years or whatever you might be blessed with to stay at Harvard, what would the education at Harvard look like 10 years from now in light of all of these changes? Well, there's no question that the technology of delivering lots of things, including education, is changing, has been changing and is changing. Uh, there are some of us, and I guess I'm old fashioned enough to believe in the idea that actually seeing the students whom one is interacting with and eventually even grading um, has a lot to be said for it. And even the now almost heretical idea that people take exams in, uh, in, instead of kind of sending them in on the internet, uh, that they actually take them where if they have a question, you can be right there to help them and blah, blah, blah. I think that the real world is moving in the direction of more distance learning. Now whether it's distance learning for an entire curriculum versus selective distance learning for certain course offerings or certain star people or certain del the delivery of certain material which is relatively easier to ingest um, is to be determined. But even at Harvard, the continuing education division which is um, a, um, one of the schools within the university that is largely has courses similar to arts and sciences, but some of them are specialty courses in business and other things. Um, they do a lot of um, uh, teaching that is done by distance learning, distance teaching and distance learning. Uh, I'm, I know that MIT puts a lot of their curricula and even course offerings up for people to be able to see. Um, footnote, I do question whether those 130,000 students, even if N other courses became available to them, are going to be getting a Stanford degree compared to some piece of paper that says they completed successfully course X. Mm -hmm. And that may be enough for them to have something mm -hmm. that says Stanford University on it. But um, it's not the same as a degree. On the other hand, if it's the learning that's most important, maybe that's an effective way of doing it. And it's certainly an efficient way of doing it. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, uh, but I just cannot end the interview uh, without asking you a baseball question. And so we'll consider this to be a bonus question uh, at the end. And uh, let, me, let me phrase it this way, and you can answer it however you choose. Mm -hmm. you, you are a uh, baseball fan of the highest magnitude, particularly of the Boston Red Sox. Uh, think back over the long and storied history of the Red Sox, mm -hmm. and there have been some good stories and some not so great stories Correct. that the Red Sox have lived through. Tell me the, the most memorable story you can think of related to the Boston Red Sox. Okay. By way of context for your audience, uh, even though the Red Sox nation, as it's called, extends nationally and internationally, I think it's fair to say this September's swoon is among the former category of extremely <laughs> negative experiences for the club. Uh, I tend to analogize to 1974, which isn't written that much about, um, but where they, on Labor Day, they, the swoon came to a, of 74, two one-nothing defeats to Baltimore on the road. 
and they never recovered from that. They went from being first to finishing seven or eight games in third place. Mm. 78, we all know about the Bucky Dent game. That was tragic, but they had done a lot of winning prior to getting to that final game. Uh, and 2010, which will long live as a premier swoon matched by the Atlanta Braves in the southeast of the United States, and they have their fans, and voila, where were the Atlanta Braves before they were even the Milwaukee Braves? They were the Boston, Boston Braves <laughs> until 1953. So the main part of your question, the most memorable experience was the final game of the 1967 season. I was at Fenway Park. It was the first time, this is kind of a, a poignant story, it was the first time that I had ever taken my father to a game. We had been to many games together, but he always took me. This was the first time that I had taken him. Mm. And we were at this game, the two teams, the Twins and the Red Sox were tied. One of them was going to be the pennant winner. No wild card, no internal playoffs. You went right to the World Series. One game settles the whole thing. And the loudest single roar I have ever been exposed to, involved with at a sporting event, bigger than when the Celtics blew out the Lakers in 2009, blah, 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 was when Carl Yastrzemski, the legendary left fielder, first baseman of the Red Sox, Hall of Famer of the Red Sox, in the bottom of the sixth, hit a line drive to center field with three men on, Two of them scored. The Red Sox were back in the game from after trailing to love. And they came back to win that ball game and become the pennant winners of 1967. 30 years later, the Red Sox asked me, because I was doing some work with them, to write the story, the pamphlet that was going to be used at the reunion of the 67 Red Sox and it was going to be distributed to the first X thousand fans each day over a weekend. And that, even in 1997, that was the biggest audience I'd ever had for anything I ever wrote in terms of reprints. Later, when I did the 2008 Olympic Games in Beijing, did a commentary on the meaning of the games for China, my friends in China afterwards said, you know, Tens of millions of people saw that because we put it on many times during the next day uh, after the opening games. And I said, well, that's the biggest classroom I've ever had and ever will have. <laughs> it's a great story. Thank you so much for coming to Lipscomb. Will you come back again? I will try my best. We're delighted to have had Professor Stephen Grazer with us today. Professor Grazer is uh, from the Harvard Business School. And we are honored to have him on our campus today speaking to our students and to community leaders. Thank you, Professor Grazer. We'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks. And thank you for joining us in today's episode of Conversations with the Dean.